Now, um, welcome to Beyond Empire, Drones, Targeted Killing, and the Future of Human Rights. Uh, today we've brought together a distinguished panel to discuss the U.S. targeted killing program through moral and legal frameworks, as well as its intersection with the human rights field. As you all may know, this event is the culmination of a student campaign. A small number of NYU law students sought to call attention to and condemn NYU Law's hiring of Harold Coe to teach international human rights. Professor Coe, a State Department legal advisor between 2009 and 2013, played a key role in creating the legal architecture for the Obama administration's extrajudicial killing program. The human cost of the drone program is undeniable. In addition to killing thousands of people in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, and elsewhere, the standards for defining a militant are vague. Any military-aged male in a strike zone is deemed a militant. On top of the killing large numbers of civilians, drone operators frequently target medical personnel and rescuers who seek to aid the injured following a drone strike. The unpredictability and terror of these drone strikes have intimidated entire societies to avoid gathering in public or even keep their children away from school. It is this reality that moved a coalition of students to author a statement of no confidence in Professor Coe. To date, it has been signed by more than 340 people, including students, activists, lawyers, concerned citizens, organizations, and scholars from around the globe. The petition was an attempt to humanize the victims of US drone policies in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, and around the world. And so long as the victims of war are not treated as people, but rather as objects to be managed, neutralized, or ogled from the sky by flying robots of death, it should not come as a surprise that those who enable these abuses want to silence anyone who humanizes their victims. We do not accept this silence. The legal advisor to the State Department, claiming his actions might be plausible interpretations of international law, is not immune to opposition. NYU Law School Dean Trevor Morrison's suggestion that our petition caused, quote, wounds that will not heal, does not concern us when thousands of people have been murdered by the U.S. drone policy for which State Department officials, including Harold Coe, are responsible. That targeted killing can plausibly be justified as consistent with human rights does not lead us to question whether or not we should speak out. Instead, it makes us question whether or not human rights law as a field and its icons, including Harold Coe, really protect human rights, or in fact, if their purpose is to protect the departments of state and their functionaries in pursuing policies of empire. And with that, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel. Mary Ellen O'Connell is the Robert and Marion Short Professor of Law and Research Professor of Dispute Resolution at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. And I'm a law faculty. And she's a law faculty. She's the former vice president of the American Society of International Law. She's been a vocal critic of the US drone program in Pakistan, the civilian casualties that have left behind, and the dubious legal excuses behind these acts. Omar Shakir is a human rights lawyer who previously worked with Human Rights Watch in Egypt. He was instrumental in the research and release of Human Rights Watch's report on the Egyptian government's massacre of roughly 1,000 demonstrators in a single day in August 2013. Shakir is the co-author of Living Under Drones, a joint Stanford-NYU law report that demystifies the U.S. drone program in Pakistan and analyzes the level of abuse and drastic human consequences that the drone program has caused. Marilyn Young is a professor of history at NYU. She's the author of Rhetoric of, uh, Rhetoric of Empire and is one of the editors of Human Rights and Revolutions. Her scholarship has sought to understand both American imperialism and those who fought against it at home and abroad. She's a founding member of the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, an academic organization begun in opposition to the U.S. war on Vietnam. Finally, Chase Madar is an NYU law graduate and former staff attorney with, the Make, the Road, uh, with Make the Road New York, which promotes the civil rights of immigrants, people of color, and the LGBTQ community. He's written extensively for the London Review of Books, Le Monde, The Nation, The National Interest, and The American Conservative. His piece, How Liberal Law Professors Kill, on Harold Coe's uh, role in the drone program, appeared in The American Conservative and Counterpunch. Uh, and finally, um, Dami will be moderating this panel. Um, before you join me in welcoming our panel, we would like to show you a brief video.
Most of the media coverage and the U.S. government line in the United States is that drone strikes are very precise and they target with surgical precision particular militants and terrorists. What we have documented is that drones kill not only terrorists, they kill many others, they kill civilians, they have killed women and children. We went to Pakistan in two separate investigation missions to speak with people who themselves had experienced drone strikes. The result of our research is a report entitled Living Under Drones. We were particularly concerned about drones because our own government is involved in using drones and we believe there has not been adequate oversight of the use of drones and the basis for deciding who gets killed, where and when. We gained access to the people in what's called the Fatah region, the federally administered tribal areas in Pakistan. That's an area that is cordoned off and into which virtually no one can enter. We were able to speak to people from that area who came out to other parts of Pakistan and to interview with us. One of the things we found is that there are entire communities who live in areas where drones are flying overhead 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at times. And these people don't know when those drones will strike. They don't know who they will strike. The result is symptoms of psychological disorder, of trauma, of severe anxiety, and of dysfunctionality. We heard stories of people who won't leave their houses. When we interviewed psychiatrists and psychologists who had treated people with these symptoms, they said that a number of people displayed very serious symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. We may not have declared war in Pakistan, but for the people living in northwest Pakistan under drones, they're in a war zone. One of the things we found and documented were incidents of double tapping. There'll be an initial strike on a target and then very shortly after a secondary strike. What has happened in the period between the first and the second strike is that neighbors or people nearby or family members or in some cases doctors have come to assist those who may have been injured and still survive. And when they're doing that, a second drone has hit. The people with whom we spoke in the communities affected, almost without exception, told us when there's a drone strike, we won't go near afterwards. And we even heard this from some medical professionals. It has made people extremely angry at the United States. The New York Times recently uh, classified drones in a piece 
as the new Guantanamo, the new recruiting tool for Al-Qaeda. One of the things we heard from several people is that they didn't know what America was before drones. And now what they know of America is drones, death, and terror. One person we interviewed asked me, do American people know what these drone strikes are doing? Do American people know the strikes are killing civilians here? And people said to us, we want you to go back, now that you've spoken to us, and tell the American public the impact that drone policies are having. Through our report, we would like the American people to understand that the narrative that they have heard about drones is not accurate. That drones cause death to civilians, they terrorize entire populations, and they may well be counterproductive at many levels. We need to rethink our policies in light of the disastrous impact the drone strikes are having on the people who live under them. I want to applaud all of you for being here and being in support of these students and the effort that they're making. It's taken a great deal of courage, and um, it's the kind of courage we should be encouraging at universities, and that's why I'm here today. Um, at a now quite infamous speech by Harold Coe at the American Society of International Law on March 25, 2010, the public heard for the very first time an official attempt to justify under international law a practice that has become known as targeted killing. According to Professor Coe, then the legal advisor of the State Department, the policy of killing people with targeted killing, mostly through drone-launched Hellfire missiles, is lawful because, quote, the U.S. is in an armed conflict with Al-Qaeda, as well as the Taliban and associated forces, close quote, in response to the 9-11 attacks. And he also said, quote, the U.S. may use force consistent with its inherent right of self-defense, close quote. Well, many of us very quickly responded to that speech. I had the opportunity at the speech itself during the Q&A to point out that there is no such thing as a global war on terror. President Obama had said as much on the campaign trail. And that targeted killing beyond an armed conflict zone is patently unlawful. Nevertheless, the number of targeted killings nearly quadrupled in the years after that speech. And so have the attempts to placate the public with arguments about the international law involved. Our speech after speech of Obama administration officials continuing to assert that this targeted killing, which by today has killed as many as 4,600 people, including as many as 200 children, is lawful under international law. In a new book chapter that should be out in May, I have been able to identify eight distinctive legal arguments again and again attempting to win the public over to this view that targeted killing with drones is lawful. Today, I'm just going to focus on two of those, the two that I've already begun with, that um, Professor Coe mentioned in 2010, some kind of global armed conflict against al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces, and self-defense under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. Of course, the global war argument has to begin with President Bush and 9-11. Within days of that terrible event, and I was here in Manhattan on 9-11, 
with many of you, President Bush um, declared a global war on terror. Well, I, along with many of my colleagues around the world, experts in the law of armed conflict, assumed that that declaration was rhetorical. It was meant to rally the nation. It was going to be the equivalent of the war on poverty or the war on drugs, or hopefully, I'm sure the president thought more successful than those past rhetorical wars to respond to the problem of terrorism. In fact, uh, our confusion was increased because the United States did go to war in a real war in Afghanistan on October 7, 2001. And the United States, as is its duty under international law, along with the United Kingdom, submitted letters to the United Nations Security Council stating the uh, various conditions under which resort to military force in self-defense is lawful and arguing that in Afghanistan, what the United States was doing was lawful. So United Nations Charter Article 51 requires, and the letters stated, that the United States had been the victim of a significant armed attack. The Security Council had found the same thing with respect to the 9-11 attacks. But the United States also made, and this is a critical argument for what we find later with, with drone strikes, that the United States said the Taliban, as the government of Afghanistan, and Afghanistan itself, therefore, the nation state, the sovereign nation state, bore responsibility under international law for the 9-11 attacks because of their close legal association with al-Qaeda. Third, the U.S. said this was necessary as self-defense for the United States to prevent future attacks. And fourth, that it would be limited to the purpose of self-defense and therefore a proportionate exercise of self-defense. So a justification in self-defense under the UN Charter has five conditions. There must be a significant armed attack. It must be a response to a sovereign state responsible for that attack. The use of force must be necessary for the purposes of self-defense and a last resort, and it must not cause disproportionate harm. And finally, there must be a letter to the Security Council spelling out all those conditions. The first use of a weaponized drone to kill someone was, in fact, in the Afghanistan war in November 2001. It was against a, an individual named Mohammed Atef, and several other people were killed alongside of him. While I'm beginning to question whether this kind of hunting and killing a named individual is lawful even on the battlefield, let's leave that aside for now and focus on the much more critical matter of doing the same thing, hunting down and killing a named person outside of an actual armed uh, conflict zone. Within armed conflict, and this is why we can presume that the Bush and Obama administrations have sought to find war around the places they want to use drones is because of something known as the combatant's privilege. Within an armed conflict, where the hostilities of armed conflict are present, so in Afghanistan, after October 7th, when the United States counterattacked that country and began what was, a, 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 under international law, an armed conflict, um, those persons fighting lawfully in the uniform of their country have the right to kill other fighters so long as they follow the law, the international humanitarian law rules found in the Geneva Conventions, the additional protocols, and other customary international law. On the battlefield, when that kind of lawful killing is going on, we do have a certain tolerance for civilians, those persons not involved in the fighting, being killed. But international law is clear. They may not be killed disproportionately. disproportionately. And what's most clear is that's only tolerable within an armed conflict. We have no collateral damage rule, no an unintentional killing of bystanders outside of armed conflict hostilities. I chaired a committee for five years of the International Law Association that had 18 of the world's leading experts, academic experts from five different continents on international law resort to the use of force. We took the Bush administration at its word that it felt it was fighting a global war on terror 
and that it was allowed to use the same techniques with drones, weaponized drones, killing persons, as it was doing in Afghanistan, beyond Afghanistan. This is what we had come to find the Bush administration was doing starting on November 4, 2002. The Bush administration had authorized the first killings carried out by the CIA based in Djibouti against six men traveling in a vehicle on a rural road in Yemen. The, they were after, the CIA was after one particular individual in that vehicle. Five others were killed, including a 23-year-old from New York. In 2003, the UN Special Rapporteur for Extrajudicial Killing, that's a title that may be familiar to NYU students because it was held for a time also by Philip Alston, but his immediate predecessor, Asma Jahangir, a human rights lawyer from Pakistan, unequivocally, without doubt, stated that that killing, that first known drone killing reported in the LA Times from the 2002 Yemen attack, was an extrajudicial, unlawful killing and a violation of fundamental human rights law. So my committee of the International Law Association began to meet in 2005. We had all this evidence. We took it very seriously, whether there could actually be some kind of worldwide war because of what had happened on 9-11 and what was going on in Afghanistan. We researched over 300 violent incidents from 1945 until 2005. And my 18 experts and I could not find any basis in international law for calling a situation far from a very definite and clearly defined situation in international law, a situation in which there were organized armed groups engaged in armed fighting of a certain amount of intensity. That's what international law calls hostilities, and those hostilities have to be present in a zone for it to be an armed conflict and for any government to have the legal right to carry out um, intentional killing using military force. Maybe it was because of our report, or maybe because some of the people who had gotten onto President Obama's kill list, his infamous kill list, had no ties of any kind to hostilities. They had not been in hostilities. They had not been trained with weapons. One person well known to my colleague, Anwar al-Awlaki, who's been defended by the Center on Civil and, uh, I'm sorry, the Center on Constitutional Rights, as far as we know, he was an American citizen, he was a Muslim cleric, he was involved in propaganda on behalf of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, he was suspected of encouraging certain persons who attempted to carry out um, uh, um, terrorist killings and persons who did carry out violent conduct but was not himself associated with this conduct. Perhaps in order to bring him, I mean, how do you even fit him into this nonsensical global armed conflict against Al-Qaeda. So then we begin to see, it's around 2010, Harold Coe's speech, a shift in the arguments away from global terror and armed conflict everywhere to self-defense. And a year ago, we saw in the Department of Justice's leaked white paper that in fact the attempt to justify killing this one individual, Anwar al-Awlaki, centered on self-defense and not the global armed conflict argument. Well, as I've already explained to you, Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, the law on armed conflict, is very strict in the conditions that are necessary to be met before the use of military force in self-defense is ever justifiable to a nation state. Those conditions were completely absent in the situation of Anwar al-Awlaki. He was killed with a Hellfire missile, with several Hellfire missiles. So that is the use of military force. They were launched from drones. They could have been launched from cruise, uh, from cruise ships or from battleships in the, uh, in the harbor. That amount of military force against an individual and those around him who is not the 
authorities of the nation state responsible for a significant armed attack on the United States that is proven to require a military response in order to defend the nation that is necessary as a last resort and proportional. Others will not be killed. It's not too much force. Those four conditions I mentioned at the outset, none of those were true of the situation around the killing of Anwar al-Awlaki. International, the United Nations Charter, Article 51, simply does not take into account the case of a small band of criminals and their terrorist plots. It's not set up for that. It cannot justify that. That's the current law. In other words, Article 51 of the United Nations Charter provides no justification for killing individuals in Yemen, Somalia, or Pakistan, countries that have not attacked the United States. Now, there have been some proposals to try to change the law so that it will do what Professor Coe has purported it does, but those proposals by various law professors have been generally rejected and shown not to be restating the current law. In 2005, the world came together at the United Nations and at the World Summit that occurred in September of that year, recommitted to those UN Charter principles I set out for you and agreed to strictly comply with them, strictly comply with them. They didn't say the law had changed. And after 9-11, everything was different and we could use military force against small groups of suspected terrorists in countries that had not attacked us. So what does that leave us with? So often when I speak on these principles and say the United States simply has no legal right to use military force in these situations, they say, what can we do? You've left us vulnerable. We're going to be open to um, insecurity. We're going to be attacked by these. We have peacetime law. We have human rights law. It does permit the police to take measures to investigate. That's what we had done until 9-11. We had been very successful, for example, in response to the 2000 attack on the coal, on the USS coal in the harbor of um, Yemen, in Aden Harbor, through the FBI, through excellent um, area experts with linguistic skills like Ali Soufan. The perpetrators of that attack had been generally arrested. They were interrogated. Their cells were, were um, uh, were dissolved, they were put on trial. It was a very successful effort. That's the way forward. That's what international law requires. Due process and the use of lethal force by police in situations that are only necessary to save a human life. For example, against a known fleeing felon who's about to escape and cause particular danger. That's when the police, as this group is well alerted to by recent examples of excessive use of, of lethal force, but we never allow our police to use hellfire missiles or to drop 500-pound bombs. Can you imagine? And yet it's in those very situations that call for police-level uses of force that our country is using drones. So let me just conclude by saying that those 4,600 deaths, those 200 children, have died in clear and fundamental violation of international law. It's not a matter, as you may hear so often, of needing to know more about the Obama administration's development of kill lists and so forth. There's nothing really more public than a Hellfire missile and the results it leaves behind. There's nothing more public than the law of the United Nations Charter, than the International Civil and Political Rights Covenant and its Article 6 that protects the right to life and denies and says to any country, you have no right to take lives arbitrarily. The part of the petition by the students objecting to Professor Coe teaching at NYU saying that he represents flawed and false policies of international law is correct. We don't need greater transparency. We know enough to agree with Asma Jahangir that targeted killing is extrajudicial murder.